Good evening. I'm spot on weather meteorologist Matthew Euler. Welcome to my next training video. And in this video, we're going to talk about cloud formation as well as cloud dissipation. Now, on any particular day, looking up to the sky, you may see a wide variety of cloud types up there in the sky. And we are really going to delve into how those clouds actually form. And then we'll talk about the processes again that will cause dissipation. So let's get right into the video. Let's first talk about the cloud formation ingredients. In order for a cloud to form, we need some of these factors really to come together. The first thing we need is a rising air motion, some kind of ascending or rising air. And as that rising air moves upward in the atmosphere, it expands. And the expanding air will eventually cool to saturation. When I say saturation, what I'm getting at is the relative humidity is 100%. And that's generally where your, your temperature and dew point are going to be the same at the saturation point. And then that saturated air will then allow condensation. And we talked a little bit about water phase changes in the last video, that last training video, condensation being that change of water from a vapor into a liquid. Now, what are some of the most common lifting processes in the atmosphere? We have convection, there's orographic lift. When I talk about orographic, I want you to think about mountains. There's frontal slope as a lifting process, and then there's low level convergence or low level converging air. We talked a little bit about low level convergence when we went over the frontal systems or the fronts training, that video. So please feel free to go back and take a look and review that. But these are the, really the four main processes um, that result in basically some form of lifting. So we're gonna break these processes down now. We're gonna talk first about convection. What exactly is convection? It's the upward transport of air. It's rising of heated air. It's referred to as free convection. Now I want you to think about free convection as basically a hot summer day. We have the sun out and it's fairly intense. Um, those incoming solar radiation, that the rays of the sun, that radiation coming from the sun, it starts with that. Right, that's also an acronym for incoming solar radiation is insulation. That insulation then heats the Earth's surface, which then heats the overlying air directly in contact with that surface through the process of conduction. Now, if you recall from my past training video, I talked about conduction being heating by direct contact. And air is a poor conductor of heat, so through the process of heating the surface, the layer is not going to be very thick. It's going to be very thin and relatively close to the surface when this incoming solar radiation heats it. Heated air, though, because of its lower density, is now going to be more buoyant and want to rise freely. And as air ascends or rises, again, it expands. It cools. And eventually, that temperature of the parcel of air will cool to the surrounding environmental air, and you'll, you'll have saturation that will occur. And if moisture is enough moisture is present through that saturation, you're going to get clouds which are going to form through convection. Now, convection, again, going back to that summer day type analogy, convection really, one of the most visible signs of convection is seeing those puffy cumulus clouds on a hot summer day. Next lifting process we'll talk about is orographic lift. So I want you to think about mountainous areas. Air is going to ascend or rise due to topography or mountains. This occurs when low level winds are going to blow basically perpendicular to large surface features such as mountains. Uh, when these winds encounter this mountainous feature, there's going to be an increase in pressure. This increase in pressure against the windward side of that mountain or that feature. And then the air is going to be forced to go up and rise over that mountain. So, Basic bottom line here is you get a perpendicular wind component to a mountain slope, right? Um, the air is not going to be able to blow through the mountain. It's got to go up against the windward side and then it has to rise. Air rises up and over the top of the mountain. And as that air rises, it expands under lesser pressure aloft because air pressure will decrease with height and it's going to cool further. And again, once your temperature and dew point are the same, you reach your saturation point, 
that's where you're going to see the presence of clouds. Next lifting process is low level convergence. This is the coming together or merging of mass or air particles near the Earth's surface. As these winds collide near the Earth's surface, they have to go somewhere. And that direction is going to be up in the atmosphere. So we got a vertical rising air motion due to these converging winds. Um, their horizontal movement is going to become blocked. The air is going to be forced to rise in the vertical uh, along the path of least resistance. And again, anytime you get air to be lifted or rising air motion, it's going to expand because of lowering pressure uh, aloft or above the ground and cool. And if moisture is present, you're going to get clouds to form in this process as well, low level convergence. And by the way, low level convergence is the most common um, type of lifting process around surface low pressure systems. And finally, let's talk about frontal lift. The frontal surface is basically going to act like a wedge, forcing the air upward over the frontal surface. Now, rising air, again, as that front moves in, the air is going to be forced to rise. Uh, it will expand, cool, and form clouds. If that moisture is present, get the saturation to occur, the temperature and dew point are the same. By the way, colder air is going to be denser and heavier, and it's going to sink near the surface as compared to warm air, which is going to be lighter, more buoyant, it's less dense. It wants to rise. So warm air is typically forced aloft as the cold air undercuts it. This would be an example of a cold front. Now frontal lift occurs to a greater vertical extent with cold fronts. All right, so I'm glad I have these uh, diagrams here to kind of show the four lifting processes we just talked about. All right, so the first thing we're going to talk about here is upper left graphic here, this diagram. We have the sun denoted here by the circular object here in the sky. Um, incoming solar radiation heats Earth's surface. The air rises in the vertical. As the air rises, it expands, it cools, it forms these clouds. And this is, an, again, an example of what's known as free convection, which typically occurs on a hot summer day. You won't have any front near you, your location. It's just going to be strictly heating of the surface, which then causes the air to rise. Um, typically in the afternoon, and evening, early evening is when you get the highest probability of these air mass thunderstorms because of this free convection process. So that's an example of convection in the upper left. If we look over here in the upper right, I'm showing you an example of orographic lifting. So you see this little mountainous feature here, right? Uh, air is basically going to be, and I'm going to draw this out, right? So we see the air is rising, right, up here on the windward side. Um, but this is totally assuming that the wind is like this. The wind is blowing uh, from this direction, from left to right, on this graph of the upper right-hand portion, blowing up against the mountain. The air is going to be forced to rise up and over the mountain. And as that air rises, again, it's going to expand, it's going to cool, it's going to reach saturation, it's going to form clouds. And in many cases, these clouds are going to form on the windward side of the mountain range. And this is really a process that really tells you why the windward side of mountain ranges are usually wetter than the leeward side, the other side of the mountain range, where the air typically is going to sink coming down the other side of the mountain. But anyway, I just want to show you orographic. So winds blowing generally from this direction, from the left to the right. Air cannot go through this mountain. It's got to get basically lifted in the vertical. It forms these clouds and precipitation on the windward side. So that's orographic lifting. Bottom left here, we're showing you an example of that frontal lift. All right, so frontal systems as they come in out of area really do help to enhance the rising air motion. And it's all about the densities of these air masses. Now, out ahead of cold fronts, you've got warmer air. And behind the cold front, you got the colder air, right? with a cold front. So this cold front is generally moving from left to right and this this black line by the way represents the um, the slope of the front. All right so as this colder denser air moves in this direction it's going to force this warm air up because it's less dense it's going to want to rise and that's going to result in this cloud to develop these clouds to develop ahead of cold fronts. In many cases you get precipitation also out of cold fronts. In the case on the right here now, 
we now have a case where we have cooler air at the surface. It's colder, it's denser, it wants to be near the ground. You get this warm front coming in, so we have warm air is going to moving up and over the denser, colder air at the surface. And this, in many cases, is going to result in more stratus clouds and steadier continuous precipitation associated with a warm frontal passage. So either case, we've got warm air rising, whether we're talking a cold front coming in or a warm front. Um, in either case, warmer air is going to rise, cooler air or colder air is going to be closer to the ground, and, and that is frontal lift. And then finally, over here in the bottom right, we show low-level convergence. So you clearly see these arrows, you know, they're coming in from both directions here. Uh, the air is meeting at the middle here, and then it's going to rise. As these two air streams converge, the air rises, and it, a converging low-level convergence is going to result in cooling, condensation um, of the air mass or the air parcel in general, and result in cloud formation and potentially precipitation. Moving on now, let's talk a little bit more now. Let's kind of delve into what saturation really is. Let me go ahead and get my... All right, so saturation overall is going to be necessary for the cloud formation. You need to have it. Um, you got to have that saturation for clouds to, to form. Kind of like what I just mentioned in my last slide, you know, you got to have where the temperature and dew point are the same, we reach saturation, okay? It occurs when air, when we reach saturation, it, this occurs when air holds its maximum possible water vapor for that particular temperature. And when, again, when the air temperature is equal to the dew point temperature, that is saturation, where the temperature and the dew point temperature are identical. Dew point temperature, by the way, is the temperature the air must be cooled in order for saturation to be reached. If air continues to rise, expand, and cool, its temperature will eventually reach the dew point and saturation will occur. The most common way of reaching saturation is by cooling an air parcel. And once a parcel is saturated, it is prepared to condense or change from a water vapor to a liquid state. Right, so this basically sums up what happens when a cloud, how a cloud forms through the process of saturation. Condensation, on the other hand, this is the process of matter changing from a water vapor, a gas, to a liquid. And in order for condensation to begin, the air must be saturated. And the water vapor is going to require a surface to condense onto. Um, one of the biggest things we talk about, and we talk about these cloud condensation nuclei, these CCNs, the atmosphere has impurities in it, whether it be smoke from a forest fire, uh, whether it be dust kicked up into the air, whether it be the sea salt coming off of rougher seas, higher, higher wave heights over the ocean. There are different impurities in the air um, in which these water droplets, this water vapor, is going to want to cling on to in order to form clouds. Um, so condensation is going to occur when saturated air comes in contact with any type of surface. It could be grass. You, know, you have experienced condensation by just going out the door in the morning, early morning wise, and you see, you know, you're walking through the grass and you notice how wet it is. The grass is not wet on a clear night because of rain, obviously. It's wet because of dew. And that's a process of condensation onto grass. Buildings can have also condensation. Automobiles, you may see condensation on your windows. In fact, I just saw condensation this past weekend just walking in and out of a store. The air mass outside was so warm and muggy and the air inside was cooler. There was such a large difference. As soon as that warm air came in contact with the cooler windows of the store, it was nothing but condensation. Um, you, another example of condensation is taking a shower. Um, by the time you get out of the shower, the cool glass on the mirror may actually have that fog over it, right? It may be wet, and that's due to condensation. The hot air from the shower is going to condense upon the cooler glass of your bathroom mirror. So bottom line is when fine particles of saturated water cling to airborne surfaces, such as that dust, the salt, the soot, uh, their condensation creates minute droplets needed to form clouds. Uh, these airborne particulates are known as cloud condensation nuclei, or CCN for short. Now, here is an example of some CCN. Although the air may look clean to us, it does contain great quantities of these cloud condensation nuclei. 
that smoke, that salt uh, from, from the wind whipping up the waves over the ocean. On any given day, the volume of air the size of just a coffee cup contains between 10,000 and 15 million particles. Do you believe that? Of course, we can't really see those with our naked eye, but they're in the air, they're in the atmosphere. Each particle makes an ideal surface on which water vapor they may, uh, may then condense upon. The best particles for these cloud, for cloud development are either what's known as hygroscopic, which means water seeking or water soluble. Now we won't get into any of the chemistry or anything like that, atmospheric chemistry wise, but just realize that hygroscopic literally means water seeking. Some of the best CCN are salt and dust. So now that we kind of know how to cloud forms, we look at the processes that cause clouds. We looked at the impurities in the atmosphere that must be in place in order for water vapor to kind of cling to, in order to form droplets and form a cloud. Now let's talk about the adiabatic process. Now adiabatic just simply refers to a process where an air parcel is going to change its temperature without exchanging heat or mass with its surroundings. And an example of adiabatic process is just the imaginary air parcel we've been discussing. It's rising, as it rises, that parcel expands and cools. Um, sinking air, if that, were, that parcel were to sink, it would warm and compress or get smaller, more compact. Adiabatic process affects the degree or rate of the cooling or warming as air rises in the atmosphere. This cooling or warming rate is going to depend on whether the air is saturated or not. With unsaturated air, I'm going to now kind of break down how air cools with height, uh, the rate at which it cools with height. There's two types of adiabatic lapse rates we're going to talk about. Now, a lapse rate is just simply the change in temperature with height. When I say dry in front of adiabatic lapse rate, what I mean is the air is unsaturated as the air parcel rises. We can also have the air parcel sink at this dry adiabatic lapse rate and it'd be the same process. This, whether it rises or sinks, is going to heat or cool if the air is unsaturated at the dry adiabatic lapse rate of 9.8 degrees Celsius per kilometer. We typically just round that up to 10 degrees Celsius per kilometer to make the math more simple. So air is initially going to rise at this dry adiabatic lapse rate, about 10 degrees Celsius per kilometer, until that rising air cools and reaches saturation, where the temperature of the parcel cools to meet the temperature of, well, basically the, it cools to the dew point as the air rises, the air parcel, and we're going to form that cloud. And that's where the saturation is going to occur. With saturated air, on the other hand, as rising air cools, its ability to hold water vapor is going to decrease. Cooler air can hold less water vapor than warmer air. So as rising air cools, its ability to hold water is going to diminish or decrease, while the relative humidity within that parcel is going to increase as the temperature gets closer to the dew point. And if the air parcel cools to its dew point temperature, it then becomes saturated. Another way to say saturation is occurring is we have 100% relative humidity. Now further lifting beyond saturation is going to result in condensation forming clouds and in some cases precipitation and as that condensation occurs it's going to release that latent or hidden heat into the immediate surroundings and the cooling process will slow due to this added heat. And then once saturated air temperatures will no longer change at the dry adiabatic lapse rate but instead will then rise or change at the moist adiabatic lapse rate, which is 6 degrees Celsius per kilometer. So, bottom line here, let's just take a parcel of air from the Earth's surface. It starts rising at the dry adiabatic lapse rate because the air is not saturated initially. As the air parcel rises, its temperature cools to the dew point. Saturation is reached. You get the clouds to form. The base of the cloud is where that saturation is reached. And then let's say the air parts of the to rise beyond that, going to rise then at the moist or the wet adiabatic lapse rate of six degrees Celsius per kilometer. And again, that's because of condensation occurring that releases heat to the surrounding environment, and that's going to basically decrease the cooling rate. So these moist saturated parcels are gonna cool or warm at this moist adiabatic lapse rate of six degrees Celsius per kilometer. 
All right, now that I've kind of said all that, I want to actually show you the rising and sinking air motion. We'll take an air parcel. We'll examine these adiabatic lapse rates, okay? All right, so initially this, this is our parcel of air. The blue, this blue circular shape represents our air parcel, okay? All right, so initially at the surface, we have an air temperature of 30 degrees Celsius and a dew point temperature of 20 degrees Celsius. They're not the same, are they? Temperature, air temp 30, dew point temperature 20, we have a 10 degree difference. So the air initially, the air parcel is gonna rise at this dry adiabatic lapse rate. 10 degrees Celsius per kilometer is how the air parcel is gonna cool. So once we get to one kilometer, we have now reached saturation. You notice how your temperature dropped 10 degrees Celsius from the surface up to one kilometer? Uh, because we're using that dry adiabatic lapse rate of 10 degrees Celsius per kilometer for the cooling. The air is unsaturated initially, the parcel's unsaturated. Once we get to a kilometer though, one kilometer, temperature and the dew point are the same, 20 degrees Celsius. So now from that point forward, the air is going to rise at the moist adiabatic lapse rate of six degrees Celsius per kilometer. So by the time we go from one to two kilometers, our air temperature is now 14 degrees Celsius. It's only dropped from 20 to 14, six degrees Celsius per one kilometer rise. Let's continue to follow the trajectory of this air parcel. By the time it gets to the top of this mountainous area, at three kilometers now, the air temperature is at eight degrees Celsius and the dew point is eight degrees Celsius. Uh, again, the air parcel, since it's saturated, the temperature and dew point are the same, it is cooling at the moist adiabatic lapse rate of six degrees Celsius per kilometer. So now we're down to eight degrees Celsius at the top of this mountain, above this mountain top. Our dew point is eight Celsius, so we're still at saturation. The temperature and dew point are the same at three kilometers above the ground. Now let's begin the journey downward. So we're still saturated, right, at three kilometers. So we're gonna use the moist adiabatic lapse rate. <clears throat> we're going to, as we come down the other side, we're going down now, we're warming. So as the air parcel moves downward, it's warming. It's also getting smaller and smaller in size, the air parcel's volume, because as the air sinks, it warms, it also compresses or contracts. So by the time we get to two kilometers on that leeward side of the mountain, our temperature is now 18 degrees Celsius and our dew point is eight degrees Celsius. Okay? And then finally at one kilometer, it's 28 Celsius and the dew point's eight Celsius. At the surface, it's now 38 Celsius and the dew point's eight Celsius. I'm not quite sure, with, and I don't know necessarily if I, if I agree with this diagram. This is the cloud, by the way, on the uh, top of the mountain slope on the windward side as the air was rising and cooling and condensing. But I mean, we're still sitting up here and we're still saturated at the top of this mountain. Um, so I think that's a typo there at two kilometers and I apologize for that. But initially from three to two kilometers, we should be sinking or warming at the rate of the moist adiabatic lapse rate. Um, which would then bring it to, what would that be? That would be 14 Celsius instead of 18. But the idea is, is once the air is unsaturated, it's going to sink at the dry adiabatic lapse rate of 10 degrees Celsius per kilometer. And so let's compare. At the surface over here, when this air parcel began to rise, the windward side of the mountain, it was at 30 Celsius. On the leeward side here at the bottom, at the surface, the other side, it's actually warmer. It's 38 degrees Celsius. So. This is the journey of an air parcel as the air, as air parcel rises and the air parcel sinks. All right, so why is that important when we talk about cloud formation, types of clouds? We need to examine the stability of the atmosphere, and this can be determined by comparing the temperature of a given parcel of air. You're going to compare that parcel's air temperature to its surrounding environmental air temperature. All right, so one stable atmosphere occurs where air has reached a comfortable state of equilibrium. Any attempt to alter an air parcel's position is met with resistance in a stable atmosphere as the air parcel attempts to regain its original position. Rising air parcel is going to be colder than its surrounding, becomes more dense than its environmental surrounding, and tends to sink back to its original position or level. Vertical motion in a stable atmosphere is generally going to be inhibited or suppressed and cloud development is hampered. And with stable atmospheres, you typically have more of the stratiform type clouds common. 
Let's examine stability here in the bottom right. This blue ball again represents the air parcel, right? So let's say um, the parcel temperature is 15 degrees Celsius, right, here at the surface over here. And the environmental temperature of the surrounding air is also 15 Celsius. So they're both the same temperature. What does this mean? If I tried to force the air parcel up to one kilometer, okay, I try to force it up, it's going to want to sink right back down to where it started because it's stable, okay? Um, we're forcing it up. Even if I were to compare the temperatures here at the one kilometer level, let's say this parcel's here at one kilometer. The air parcel temperature is five degrees Celsius while the surrounding environmental temp is 18 Celsius. So this parcel is going to be colder than the environmental temperature and that parcel is going to want to sink back to the surface. So that's an example of a stable atmosphere. Unstable atmosphere, on the other hand, air parcels must go to greater lengths to seek equilibrium. Um, unstable atmospheres do not inhibit or resist outside influences on partial motion. If a parcel is displaced in any direction in an unstable atmosphere, it's going to likely continue in that direction. Uh, rising air is warmer than its surroundings, becoming less dense, and it will continue to rise in the vertical. With an unstable atmosphere, this is typically where you see the cumulus clouds, quite common. So let's look at the example here in the bottom right. So we start off with environmental temperature of 18, parcel temperature of 18, the air, the parcel's forced to rise. It's up to one kilometer now. The environmental temperature is 11 degrees Celsius, but the parcel temp is warmer. It's 15 degrees Celsius. So because the parcel temp is warmer, this parcel will continue to rise. It's warmer than its environmental temperature. By the time we get up to two kilometers, the parcel temperature is now 11 degrees Celsius, and the environmental temperature is four degrees Celsius, so this parcel is just going to keep rising and rising and rising. This is an example of an unstable atmosphere. Notice the displacement of the parcel in the vertical, and that parcel just keeps moving away from its original starting position. It's a great example of an unstable atmosphere. For neutral stability, on the other hand, the displaced parcel of air will remain in its current position. It's not going to resist movement nor continue in a given direction. Uh, an air parcel must have the same temperature and density characteristics of the air around it to be neutral, neutrally stable. Um, the parcel will maintain the same lapse rate as its environment. It may be obtained, neutral stability may be obtained in either a saturated or a dry air mass. Um, since vertical motion is neither enhanced nor suppressed, neutral stability will have no effect on cloud development. All right, so now let's look at lapse rate a little bit closer, okay? I mentioned it earlier, lapse rate is simply the rate at which the air temperature changes with changing height in the vertical. All right, so let's take a look at a sample sounding here. Um, on, the, on the horizontal axis here, we have temperature in degrees Celsius. It's in five degrees Celsius increments from five to 35 Celsius, right here on, the, on this uh, x-axis here, the horizontal axis. In the vertical axis, we have a height in kilometers ranging from the surface up to five kilometers. Now this black solid line represents the air temperature changes with height. So we start off here near the surface, temperature is about 27, 26, 27 Celsius at the surface. As air rises up to one kilometer, you notice how it's cooling with height. You notice how it continues to cool with height, the air parcel, as it's forced to rise. You notice how it's rising in this direction. That's an example of a positive lapse rate where the air temperature, the air parcel cools with height. If I were to go from two to three kilometers now, notice how this line bends back to the right between two and three kilometers. That's an example of a negative lapse rate. Now your air parcel is warming with height. Its temperature is warming with height. You clearly see here on the bottom going to the right is going to be a warming process by these higher values for the temperature in degrees Celsius. So that's a negative lapse rate when the temperature warms with height, and it's an isothermal lapse rate between three and four kilometers in this example. See how it's just a straight vertical line here? That means the temperature is neither cooling nor warming. It's remaining the same between three and four kilometers. And then we have a positive lapse rate again um, as the air is cooling, it's bending, the air parcel is cooling with height from four to five kilometers. So, this is an example of what we would look at on a sounding using a skew T diagram. This is what a lot of the storm chasers are going to look at before they go out and do their storm chasing. They're going to look at what is the atmospheric profile in the vertical. Do we have positive lapse rate on a particular day? Positive lapse rates are typically associated with an unstable atmosphere. Or do we have a negative lapse rate or some kind of cap 
aloft, preventing thunderstorms from developing, warming with height is going to be a stable process. Okay. Positive lap trait unstable, negative lap trait stable. So lap trait, more information on this, it's likelihood for severe weather occurrence is directly related to the atmosphere's current stability. Whether the atmosphere is stable or unstable, a less stable environment poses an increased risk of developing deadly weather phenomena, such as those tornadoes that sometimes you see. Uh, to determine stability, you compare the environmental and the adiabatic lap traits. Okay? Uh, you must look at multiple levels of the atmosphere in the vertical to gain an accurate picture of that tropospheric layer. Specifically, that's where the weather is occurring in the troposphere. For lapse rate, again, just change in temperature over the change in height. Just simply put, gamma, the letter gamma here, this Greek letter gamma here, um, this represents lapse rate meteorology. This is equal to minus... This triangle represents a change in. T is temperature over a change in the height. So gamma is equal to, or lapse rate is equal to minus, you keep the minus sign out in front, the change in temperature delta T over the change in height delta Z. Let's look at some examples of a positive lapse rate first. Let's say the temperature at one kilometer is 15 degrees Celsius. And then we have a temperature at three kilometers at five degrees Celsius. So plugging these values in, 15 and five, all right, we use our equation. Uh, lapse rate is equal to minus the change in temperature over the change in height. So you keep the minus, let me show you here. Let me just circle it here. You're going to keep this minus symbol out ahead of this temperature difference between five C minus 15c so you take three the temperature at three kilometers minus the temperature at one kilometer okay keep the negative sign out in front so that gives us a minus a plus five minus 15 is a negative 10c a minus and a minus is a positive in math okay that's going to become a positive um, and we're only examining between three and one kilometer. So that's a two kilometer difference in height. So that's where we're getting this two kilometer. So the overall, we have a positive sign. That means we have cooling with height, a positive lapse rate of five degrees Celsius per kilometer. Temperature is decreasing with height, cold air over a warm air situation in this case. That's going to depict less stable conditions. Cold air wants to sink, warm air wants to rise. That's unstable. A negative lapse rate example, we're going to use the same exact temperatures, plus 15 C at 3 kilometers, plus 5 Celsius at 1 kilometer. There's your gamma for your lapse rate. You keep that negative sign out in front and just take the difference between um, this 3 kilometer temperature and this 1 kilometer temperature. So we keep the negative sign out in front. We take the difference, 15 minus 5, it's going to be a plus 10, but we still have that negative sign out in front, so we have a negative type of value here. And it's over two kilometers again because we're looking at three kilometers minus one kilometer. That's a two kilometer difference in height. So this is an example of a negative lapse rate where temperature is going to increase with height. Warmer air is over cooler air at the surface. Atmospheric stability is going to generally increase. This is going to suppress vertical cloud development. All right, and finally to end today's training, we're going to look at cloud dissipation processes. All right, and these are mainly removing moisture or raising the temperature. Those are two main mechanisms in the atmosphere in which we're going to dissipate clouds. Let's take a look at removing the moisture first. All right, so moisture can be removed from the atmosphere and from the cloud through precipitation. Have you ever heard on a hot summer day, like a pretty good thunderstorm develops and this heavy downburst of rain just comes out of the base of the cloud, out of this thunderstorm cloud? This is an example of clouds literally raining themselves out. And this happens very frequently in the summer with these stronger bursts of rain showers coming from thunderstorms. You can also get dry air entrainment. That's gonna occur near the edges of clouds. So the air outside the cloud mixes with the air inside the cloud. This dry air outside is going to be heavier and creates sinking air motion within the cloud when it's entrained inward. Moist air is lighter, dry air is heavier. This dry air is then gonna result in sinking vertical motion once it gets entrained into the cloud and you're going to have 
the cloud dissipation. Uh, evaporation occurs when going from a liquid to a water vapor. Uh, this removes moisture from the air parcel. Uh, and evaporation will also act to dissipate clouds. It cools surrounding air. It cooler air is heavier and sinks. Anytime we get heavier air that's sinking, it's going to basically dissipate the cloud. It causes the air parcel to become compressed, raising the air parcel's temperature. It results in a drying out of the parcel, decreasing the relative humidity. Additionally, for removing the moisture, this is an example of adiabatic warming or lee side effect along mountains. Uh, air is going to descend at the dry adiabatic lapse rate. It's going to undergo compressional warming and dry significantly. Common along the mountains, but all occurs anywhere, air is forced downward. Okay, so here are our two main processes we talked about with this. We talked about removing the moisture, dry air entrainment. This occurs again when drier air mixes in, mixes in, starts on the outer edge of the cloud and gets inside the cloud. Um, that heavier drier air then is going to result in sinking air motion causing the cloud to dissipate. Um, and then over here on the bottom right we have air flowing downslope of a mountain that is going to result in compressional adiabatic warming and is going to dry basically dissipate the cloud on the leeward side. All right, that wraps up the training in cloud formation and dissipation. Hopefully you enjoyed the presentation. Um, you know, some of the stuff can be kind of confusing, um, especially if you don't have much of a meteorology background. I, and it, it really takes some thought. Um, you really have to play around like the air parcels, you know, and, and give them different temperatures, compare that to the environmental air at the various levels of the atmosphere and, determine whether you have a stable or unstable situation. Um, so it can be a little bit confusing and a little bit intimidating, but I hope, hopefully you realize what, you know, we talked about cloud formation first. We talked about how do you get clouds to form? You gotta get rising air. The rising air is gonna expand, leading to saturation. The saturation eventually with the temperature and dew point are the same. Uh, it's gonna allow for condensation, going from a water vapor to a liquid, the cloud forms. Uh, the lifting processes, whether we're talking convection due to intense surface heating on a hot summer day, as an example, mountain or graphic lift, um, when the wind blows strongly uh, at a perpendicular straight at a mountain slope, the air is forced to rise up and over the mountain slope. Um, frontal slope, in any case, we have cooler, denser air near the surface, warmer air aloft, and then low level converging air associated with low pressure systems. We went over those uh, processes more in depth we talked about them here in the diagram. Uh, then we went into the saturation point in review here. Um, saturation occurs when the te air temperature and dew point are equal to each other. Um, talked about condensation again a little bit and how we have to have cloud condensation, nuclei, these, these um, particles like the smoke, the dust, the soot, sea salt for water vapor to condense upon. That's what we're really showing you here is each one of these little um, this yellow little ball shape represents one of these CCNs and then you see how their the water vapor is basically attracting itself to the CCN. So we're just trying to show you that here in this diagram. Um, if the atmosphere is completely pure, purely clean, uh, there would be no clouds by the way because of that aspect. And then we talked about the um, different rates at which air rises whether it's dry or unsaturated, 10 degrees Celsius per kilometer. Whether it's saturated, the air is gonna rise at six degrees Celsius per kilometer. Uh, and then we did a little example here as air rises and sinks. We talked about stability. Um, you're comparing the environmental temperature to the air particle temperature. If the air particle temperature is colder than the environmental temperature, the air is gonna sink, you have stable atmosphere. If the um, air particle temperature is warmer than the environmental air, then the air parcel is going to continue to rise and you have an unstable atmosphere. Then we talked about neutral stability where the temperature and dew point are the same. We examined lapse rates, the different types, positive lapse rate, temperature is cool with height. Uh, we have a negative lapse rate um, where the temperature is warm with height. Isothermal lapse rate, temperatures do not change at all with height. And then we just kind of examined some example problems here, positive versus negative lapse rate using this lapse rate equation. And then we talked about removing moisture. If you raise the temperature, in either cases, you're going to dissipate the clouds. All right, that wraps it up, everybody. Thank you so much for subscribing to the Spot on Weather YouTube channel. I have more training ahead. I can't wait to share it with you. If you're ever interested in 
like how fog forms, the different types of fogs. Uh, that's the next training presentation. So uh, again, I hope you enjoy these training sessions. Hope you're learning as much as possible about the wonderful world of weather. That's all I got for now, everybody. Till next time, take care and God bless everyone. Thank you.